Good day, and today we're going to look a little bit at the history of the English Restoration and the 18th century. For dates, that would be around the times of 1660 to approximately 1785. First, we look at religion and politics in order of the Restoration. We see in the Stuart line the return of Charles II to the throne after the interregnum of the Cromwell family, during which Britain was run by Puritans or dissenters. Now, Anglican bishops were not tolerant of dissent, and we see this also this widespread anti-Catholic sentiment. Uh, for example, they're the ones who are blamed for the fire of London and having this fictional popish plot where they're trying to make uh, England part of the Holy Roman Empire. We also have a test act that required all who attend university and all holders of civil and military office to take the sacraments and to deny belief in the transubstantiation. Now, of course, James II, a Catholic, did not hide his sympathies like his father had, so we're going to see him being ousted, and the Stuart line is going to be essentially gone. So after that, we have Dutchman William of Orange and his wife, James's Protestant daughter Mary, come to London, and James flees to France in the bloodless revolution. So the Catholics are no longer in charge of England, and we start seeing a Protestant uh, reformation. Now... James's supporters, called the Jacobites, persisted, especially in Scotland, until a final unsuccessful uprising by Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745. Now, succession settled on a German Sophia, Electress of Hanover, and her descendants, otherwise the granddaughter of James I. And you're going to start seeing the German side coming in to the Georges in the 1700s. Taking a look at England's new wealth, with the War of Spanish Succession in 1702, that weakens England's commercial rivals. And so as England is finding more colonizations and becoming a wider power on the world stage, they're going to gain new colonies and contracts to supply slaves to the Spanish colonies. Now, new wealth also creates tensions between old and new money. Continuing on with ideas of politics with the Whigs and the Tories, these aristocratic parties will fight for the ascendancy throughout this entire period. Now, who are the Whigs? They're like petroleum conservatives. They, they tolerated the dissenters, and they support new money interests. Say, for example, as the new rich is coming in, like bankers and merchants, and they push for a more centralized government. Tories would be more like a Bible Belt conservative. They support the monarchy. They stab the established church, the sense of tradition, affirmed land ownership as a proper basis of wealth, and they're very suspicious of a centralized government that rewarded followers, the newer followers that create their wealth. But then as we see the empire of Great Britain grow, we start seeing a bit of an emergency. Now, the first prime ministers of this period, where we look at Walpole and Pitt, they're going to help expand British power and commerce overseas. Now, as Great Britain becomes a colonial power ruling over places like Canada and India, they're going to start losing some of their colonies. In, in essence, around the 1770s and the 1780s, they begin to lose some of their American colonies, even though they hang on to Canada. Now, the slave trade will also enrich Great Britain. Now, opposition to slavery is widespread, however, by both Anglicans and the Methodists. So as we start seeing more of this discontent with the idea of slaves or the idea of new money versus old money, uh, the great wealth does not spread to the poor. Women remain disenfranchised, so we see this greater divide in society. Now, in 1780, London riots are going to turn the poor, the Catholic and the Protestants, against each other. Now, popular King George has got a 60-year rule, but he inherited madness and increasingly mars his rule throughout the 1700s. Also, there is fear of radicals who call for a new democracy that contributes to the British reaction against the French Revolution in the 1780s and 90s.
So when we look at this idea of revolution as it came into the United States and as it started spreading throughout Europe, we have this idea of contrast with the monarchy and a sense of compromise. We have some holdovers of the original English Revolution, the idea of Pilgrim's Progress and Paradise Lost that expressed the conscience of dissenters, that it's okay to dissent so long as you still know your place in society. Now that's in contrast with court in which Charles II and his followers aggressively celebrated pleasure and considered London's wives and daughters fair game for them. Now, compromise is also brewing among intellectuals, and there's suspicions of all excess. So even though the, uh, the monarchy now rules with a parliament, we still see excesses happening in the monarchy after the restoration, and the intellectuals and the other new rich that are coming in are beginning to dissent against that. There's also suspicion of dogmatism and enthusiasm. Everybody seems anxious to avoid strife of 1640 to 1660. After the restoration of, of King Charles II, it seems like everybody wants to try and compromise and get along. All dogma also seems to be unpopular. At this point in time, we can see there's a Puritan enthusiasm trying to purify the church after all of the reformations, um, and there is this strike out towards uh, the colonies in the United States and other areas in order to go create a different world away from England. We also see papal infability and the divine right of kings and the idea of modern Cartesian philosophy where we're getting away from the idea that somebody in charge of the church is in charge of our daily lives. We also are in pursuit of absolute certainty. We're beginning to get the foundations of an industrial revolution and of a more widespread middle class. Now, for religious people and cynics, faith can take up where reason and sensory evidence fails. So you will have a bit of this great awakening that's going to happen towards the middle to the end of the 1700s, just as the Industrial Revolution is taking a great hold in Great Britain. And with that, we also have new theories coming along, whether or not people wanted to believe in these new theories uh, or whether or not they didn't because of their faith and dogma. There seems to be a distrust from some, whereas there is an awakening in others. For example, we have new scientific theories. <clears throat> Hobbes supports the absolute government because of scientific theories of matter in motion. A human desire for power apparently leads to a state of war. We also see the idea of the atomic theory happening and the advancement of empirical studies by careful systematic observations is likely the greatest contribution of 18th century England to the world, where we're now going to use that sense of hypothesis and theories and systematic observations in order to test. However, science is still pretty much a lay activity. We're looking more with science to the idea of natural history, which is the collection and description of natural facts, and natural philosophy, the study of those facts. We see the foundations of the microscope and the telescope coming into use here. They're now expanding the complexity of our universe. We also have Afra Bain translating Fontenelle's conversation of the plurality of worlds, which suggests there might be alternate universes to our own. And along with colonial exploration and colonization, we increase an appetite for these wondrous facts about new flora and fauna that are being discovered by the British around the world. As we continue into the Industrial Revolution, the discovery of electricity leads to more fashionable experiments with electrocution. And we also see Matthew Bolton as one of the first to create factories that are powered by steam engines. The foundations of chemistry also grow because chemistry allows the new market by Wedgwood in domestic porcelain. Now, as we continue into the Industrial Revolution, we look back at this sense of a great awakening where we look at a natural religion or deism. Now, Newton's discoveries suggest that there must be a universal order in creation that is created by God like a watchmaker and a watch. 
Our encounter with other non-Christian peoples as they colonize as well leads to this universal religious tenet that could be embraced by rational beings, that everybody has a religious tenet underneath a Christian and a non-Christian umbrella. And that leads to the idea of deism, where reason recognizes goodness and wisdom of God, and there is a sense of natural law between all. There's no need for mystery or maybe even the Bible. Now, Deism's God winds the world like a watch and then withdraws it. And so American founders like Ben Franklin would embrace this sense of deism, which seemed like a better foundation for a new nation than a religious division where you would have several colonies kind of being led by several different religious backgrounds. We also have this sense of empiricism as the colonies begin to grow. For example, from Berkeley, we find out that we know the world only through our senses. We cannot prove that material things exist. And so therefore, we have this reliance on faith as we continue uh, industrializing the colonies that we know and exploring into the new colonies. We start wondering what we cannot prove. Hume also says that causes and effects are discernible by experience and not by reason. You need to experience something in order to have the, the effects of it. We also in philosophy look at Locke as he examines the limits of human understanding to help us avoid meddling in things that exceed our comprehension. And as well, we also see Swift and Pope warning us against metaphysics, abstract logic, and theoretical science. After all, Pope states, presume not God to scan. Now, women are currently disfranchised during this time period, but we start seeing people like Mary Estelle arguing for women's educational institutions and decrying marital tyranny, where they are not allowed to divorce, they're not allowed to keep their property, uh, they're not allowed to even fight in court for their children. And she mocks Locke's insistence on political rights for men only. We do see other people, such as Richard Steele, advocating improvement in women's education, and their sociability outside of the home. Now, with the sense of this great awakening, we're also going to see a new religion forming, and that would be Methodism, which is an evangelical sect that's promoted by John Wesley et al. and preached salvation through faith, not through your mercy works. Now, there's also a new emphasis on individuals and a personal God. Diary keeping, letter writing, and writing novels all testify to the importance of a private and individual life, uh, how you are trying to improve your life through this private intersection with God. Now, as we're starting to look at this sense of literary production, not only from a literature standpoint, such as poetry or plays or novels, but actually looking at the nonfiction as well, we see a government licensing being relaxed and replaced by laws against sedition, libel, obscenity, and even treason. However, stage licensing will remain, and all but two royal theaters are closed down. We see copyright is vested with the publishers and the authors, and it begins to profit by subscription of these copyrights. For example, Pope earns 5,000 pounds for his Iliad translation in one year alone. We also start seeing the beginning of stamp acts that allowed taxation of newspapers. Now this unfortunately puts some out of business, but helps others to thrive. We are also starting to see of a more educated class where there will be more writers. And there's a new professional writing class that's being formed. Now, one of the places we see in London is called Grub Street, in which you see poor writers living and working with one another. The market is also going to appeal to a literary elite. Few now write except for pay where they're not writing anymore for some great duke or earl who's going to be their patron. Now they're actually writing on their own. Now, subscription stories would also allow for new wealth if you wrote for a newspaper or for a publishing company, but it also helps women's writing, which otherwise had trouble finding publishers. 
Now, most of the time, in this particular time period, the writers are going to still be mostly wealthy or middle class because of the education that is involved. But some poor authors are going to make it into print. For example, Mary Collier's The Woman's Labor. Now, with the education and literacy increasing for all, we're also going to see that in women as well. Now, male literacy was as <clears throat> much as 75% by the end of the period in the 1780s, but we actually start seeing a better education of women, perhaps 25% for women. And literacy is mostly urbanized because of the accessibility to books, and it usually is surrounded by the Bible. Now, women are still being barred from universities, so all of these women are going to be self-educated. And most of them are going to be of the wealthier classes. Aristocratic women are going to publish widely, uh, especially poems, because that would be considered at least something that women could enjoy, so therefore it's something that women could read. Now, some scandalous writers of popular stories of sex, satire, and seduction were denounced by men as immoral. For example, Pope Stuncia de depicts a pissing contest of scurrilous male booksellers that was won by a woman, Eliza Haywood. We also see the Blue Stockings movement, which are intellectual women who favored moral literature, especially novels about young women who are approaching the age of marriage. Now, of course, we're still talking about the middle class and the wealthy being educated because books are still too expensive for laborers, as were even just a lending library was hard for them to find. Now, the poor were sometimes taught to read as a religious activity by their aristocratic masters. Uh, maybe if they were working um, near a church or near a school, you might see a couple of the poor actually being taught some fundamentals in reading. You also see patrons that are interested in beginning to collect letters and travel literature and novels and be able to start creating these into different subscriptions or lending libraries that others could use. We also see a change of printing coming more into the modern type. For example, capitalization is now being reserved for proper names instead of being used for almost all nouns. There is fewer italics for emphasis, which suggests a more sophisticated reading public as we're starting to normalize our formatting for printing. There also happens to be a new emphasis on clarity for literature. During this time period of the 1600s and throughout most of the 1700s, you're looking at restraint, this elegant simplicity that the writers are using. There's a rejection of Don's metaphysics and Milton's large themes where we're looking into very heavy philosophy. We're looking instead at seeing something for what it is. Now, we also see a classical revival with English themes in this neoclassical or Augustan period and Dryden's interest in literature for moral instruction. Things are going to become more restrained, more refined in their writing. Towards the end of the 1700s, you also see this new interest in nature, and that would be the external nature, where you're looking at landscapes, forests, uh, the seas, and human nature's enduring universal truths that are tied to nature. So we're looking at the external nature, like landscapes, but also human nature that will be tied to that nature. Now, the study of the ancients seems synonymous with the study of nature, to combine the method with for and judgment with the fancy of nature itself. Now, again, remember, we are looking at new colonies, and so therefore we find new flora and new fauna. So there's this newer interest in actual landscapes and nature. When we look at the sense of poetry, we're also looking at a more readable verse. Now, style is going to be dominated by personification, paraphrases, Latinate words, and words that are forced into a Latin syntax. Again, with the new sense of education and the sense of wanting to go back to the classics, a little bit of a revival of the classics, you're going to see a lot of Latinate words and Latinate syntax happening. You're also going to see the revival of a heroic couplet. So for example, the rhymed iambic pentameter, A-A-B-B, -B, that we're going to inherit from Ben Jonson very early on. 
And poetry here is going to be a little different from the nonfiction writing. Instead of it being very clear and restrained, it's going to be elaborately stylized. And you look at for it for moralizing, but also for a sense of wit. And then you're also going to see it more elaborately stylized by even starting in the 1700s, the start of a blank verse, an unrhymed iambic pentameter that is favored for more meditative poems as we start moving towards a more romantic natural movement. Now, when we look at restoration literature from about the early ages of 1660 to 1700, Dryden is going to dominate it. The literature is going to combine the latest European trends with more English-favored topics. We're also, again, going to look at the classics being revived. It's going to make Ovid and Virgil accessible through translations. You also begin to see royal literary societies that are asking for prose to become more plain and more utilitarian for the masses. This is in contrast with the elaborate style of Milton's pamphlets and Don's sermons of the previous age. Once again, we're looking at classic heroic subjects, for example, looking again at Ovin and Virgil, mostly because the aristocrats are asking to look back towards that uh, heroic age. We also see in restoration drama, you're going to favor comedies of manners featuring pleasure-seeking males who prey on beautiful, witty, yet somehow emancipated women. Looking into 18th century literature around the turn of the century, you also have the great age of satire. As we have our modern drama becoming more witty, we're also going to see that kind of drifting over into the prose. Wit is turning against fanaticism and innovation, and you have what are called the mock epics by people such as Pope, Jonathan Swift, and even Gay. You also have new prose genres coming out. We have allegories being created. You have biographies of notorious criminals being formed. Travelogues as people are traveling to the different colonies. People are writing about gossip, romances that are often extremely fictionalized. And you look at a little bit of the beginnings of the modern novels, such as William Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and Ben's Orochno. Sentimental dramas are, are also going to reject immoral comedies of the earlier age. Now your drama is going to feature characters choosing between love and honor. It's a complete opposite of the period before. In the early 1700s, you're also going to see poetry about sublime beauties of nature. You're also going to see how low subjects prefigure the Romantic Age. This is the very start or the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and so you're going to start seeing not only these nature's landscapes uh, being turned into more suburban and even urban areas, but we're also going to be looking back at the classics. In prose, you're going to see novels are more popular than poems for the first time. Essays, literary criticism, biographies, philosophies, politics, history, aesthetics, economics, so many different genres are going to pop up between 1740 and 1845 that we're beginning to see the foundations of modern literature. Memoirs of women also are going to create celebrities who let readers into their private lives. Again, the gossip and romance that was being created in the earlier part of the century is now very prominent, especially for women who are looking for things to read on vacation. Aristocratic, uh, middle class, the wealthy that are traveling. Epistolary novels and satires are also being written. You're going to see the beginnings of the Gothic novels in the early 1800s, uh, the experimental fiction that is influenced by Cervantes in Spain and Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy are also being created at this time. You're also going to see the beginnings of the first dictionaries happening in the late 1700s, and poems were very melancholy. They lament the loss of the poetic age, of the previous ages, all the way back to the classics of the Greek and Romans, and even in the just previous age before. Thank you so much for stopping by to learn a little about the restoration period in the 18th century. If you'd like me to go into more depth on any of these subjects, please leave a comment down below about what else you'd like me to teach you. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. Take care.